Emmaus and faith. We're looking at Luke chapter 24, verses 13 through 35. I read it to you just a few moments ago. But if you'd like to take your Bibles and turn back to that portion of Scripture, that's where we're looking today. Luke is the only one of the Gospel writers to record the Emmaus Road encounter. As those two rush back to Jerusalem to tell their story, Jesus himself appears even as they are speaking in full confirmation of their account. Then notice verse 48. It's a statement of a factual reality, a commission, and an obligation. Verse 48. And ye are witnesses of these things. Factual reality, commission, obligation. Where Luke finishes his account of the Gospels, he picks up again in the book of Acts. And you know there's really no break in the narrative, but a re-emphasis on the requirement of being witnesses. The former treatise have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus both began to do and teach until the day in which he was taken up. After that, he, through the Holy Ghost, had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs, being seen of them forty days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. And being assembled together with them, commanded them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, Ye have heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. And they therefore were come together. They asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power, but ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up in a cloud, received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. Even though there are 11 distinct appearances of Christ following the resurrection, Luke goes straight from the road to Emmaus, to the upper room, to the ascension, and the requirement, ye shall be witnesses. The title of the message today is Emmaus in Faith. The heart of the message is this. If you have come in contact with the living Christ, it is your privilege and your obligation to be a witness for him. Knowing about him is not enough. You must have a personal salvation encounter. If you are not a witness for him, it is questionable whether or not you are truly saved. Jesus said, you shall be witnesses. He didn't say, some of you shall be witnesses. He didn't say, being my witness is optional. He didn't say, you shall be my witnesses if you have the gift of evangelist. There were no caveats. There were no modifiers. There were no loopholes. There were no excuses. Ye shall be witnesses unto me. The two on the road to Emmaus already knew the technical details. The text tells us that they'd already heard the reports of the women who were at the tomb. They had already heard the testimony of the apostles who visited the tomb and found it empty. They admit all of this to Jesus who patiently listens to them. 
They already had the Old Testament prophecies in their possession. They'd heard them from their childhood. They had personally heard Christ before as he taught for three and a half years in their midst. They'd already seen the miracles and seen the prophetic fulfillment of the cross, the cutting off of Messiah. But they hadn't believed. You see, knowing the facts does not save you. Knowing the facts does not change your life. And what does Jesus say to them? Luke 24, 25. And he said unto them, O fools and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. The issue is the scriptures. The issue is not even all the miracles that they had seen nor the testimony of the other eyewitnesses. They had already heard the other eyewitnesses as they admit to Jesus at the beginning of their conversation. The issue was, how are you going to respond to the scriptures? More than 45 years ago, I wrote a definition of faith, which all the children and adults in our church in San Antonio memorized. That definition of faith is still good today. Faith is complete confidence in the word of God. Saving faith is created in the elect by what the sovereign God reveals himself to be. Every occurrence of faith in the Bible fits that definition. Faith always takes you back to the word of God, either spoken as it was to the prophets or written as it has been handed down to us. Hebrews 11 gives us a description of faith. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen, followed by illustrations of that description. But that's not the definition, it's a description. Biblical faith is always tied to the word of God, either written or spoken, and you see that with every hero of faith in Hebrews 11. Genuine faith is a living faith. A living faith is a faith that seeks to reproduce just like every living creature that God made reproduces. Living faith is a faith that hastens, that tells the good news with breathless excitement. Living faith is a faith that expects results because the messenger relies on the supernatural working of the Holy Spirit of God rather than relying on his own cleverness. Living faith was what the two on the road to Emmaus were lacking as they walked and talked. They were talking about the right subject, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. They knew the facts related to the death. They knew the facts related to the resurrection. They had heard eyewitness testimony from those who saw him. It had made an intellectual impact. They were actually questioning what it all meant. But they didn't really believe. How do we know? Because they were walking away from Jerusalem. Living faith does something with the facts that it believes and that it knows without question or truth. It doesn't merely store the facts in the cubbyhole for future reference when writing a paper or answering a question when the teacher calls on you. Living faith does something. James makes it clear. In fact, he tells us not once but six times that faith without action is dead. Not only is there fake news, there is fake faith. And a lot of professing Christians have fake faith. Real faith is always seen in action in the Bible. It is never seen as theoretical. James chapter 2, even so faith, if it hath not works, is dead. Verse 18, 
I will show thee my faith by my works. Verse 20. O vain man, that faith without works is dead. Verse 22. Faith wrought with his works, and by works was faith made perfect. Verse 23. By works a man is justified, and not by faith only. Verse 26. So faith without works is dead also. Six times. You cannot miss it. And so we see the lesson applied on the road to Emmaus. The two whom I believe to be the uncle and aunt of Jesus, as I've explained in other years, are walking away from Jerusalem with a full head knowledge about Jesus. If they were, as I think, his uncle and aunt, they were even more accountable than most. They knew everything that they had to know to have faith. If knowledge is all that's required of faith, but they didn't have faith. They were as lost as a couple of rocks at the bottom of the Grand Canyon. Even when Jesus was giving them a personalized Bible lesson as they trudged home, and even though they were getting warm fuzzies, they still didn't believe. They said, did not our hearts burn within us? Warm fuzzies. So it's not enough to have knowledge even if you have warm fuzzies. Faith is not the same as knowledge, and faith is not the same as warm fuzzies. But faith is closely related to the scriptures. It's a question of believing the scriptures concerning who Jesus is and what Jesus did. You cannot have faith without the scriptures, because the scriptures point to the real Jesus Christ. And so the scriptures were the touchstone to which Jesus turned as he walked with them to their home. Then he said unto them, O fools and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. And when they understood who he was and believed, what did they say? They said one to another, Did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us by the way? And while he opened to us the scriptures. It was the word of God that the Holy Spirit used to open their heart to saving faith. It was not philosophy. It was not apologetics. It was not debate. It was not rational argumentation. It was not a class in theology. It was not a majority vote. It was not, well, I'll believe this because it's popular with my friends. It was not experience even though they had personal experience to get it where the rubber meets the road, the ultimate factor was the scriptures. Remember, as they walked toward Emmaus, Jesus expounded the scriptures to them, and they sensed the power of the scriptures, but their eyes were holden that they should not know him. You can sit under sound Bible exposition and you can know that it's sound Bible exposition without understanding it and without believing it, even though you feel really great about hearing it. But revelation and even inspiration are not the same thing as illumination. Revelation is when God gives the new information. Inspiration is that information when it's written down perfectly under the sovereign direction of the Holy Spirit. But illumination is when the Holy Spirit opens your eyes to understand it. The two on the road to Emmaus didn't understand and therefore did not have faith until Jesus took charge of their dinner table and broke the bread and vanished. At that point, the Holy Spirit gave them understanding and faith. And then what do they do? They immediately dropped everything. They ran back to Jerusalem. Now remember, they've just walked 60 furlongs away from Jerusalem. A furlong is about an eighth of a mile, or in terms of quarter mile running track, 220 yards. Thus, 60 furlongs is the equivalent of walking 7.5 miles over rocks and mountainous terrain. If the two on the road to Emmaus were Jesus' uncle and aunt, and Jesus was in his early 30s, they were probably in their late 50s or early 60s. They were obviously not walking too fast because they had time for Jesus to give them an extended lesson on Old Testament prophecy. By the time they got to their house in Emmaus, they were tired. It was already evening. When Jesus revealed himself, they had just finished eating dinner. It was time to go to bed. 
But suddenly the illuminating work of the Spirit of God jolted them awake like a shock of lightning. It threw them off their chairs. It slammed them out the doors. They didn't hang around to wash the dishes. They didn't sit in their chairs for a while talking about it. They immediately bolted out into the night. Faith had suddenly come alive. Faith doesn't sit on its hands or twiddle its thumbs. Genuine faith springs immediately into action. Just remember, they were old people. And they were tired after a full day of walking. They'd already had plans to go to bed. They'd just eaten a big meal. Not a time to go running. But they ran back to Jerusalem in the dark. Night on the road was a dangerous time to be out. There were robbers. There were wild animals. There were possibility of a heart attack. There were night creatures like scorpions. There were criminals. I know what that's like. One evening, Judy and I were walking in the early evening over the top of the Mount of Olives as the stars were coming out. Suddenly, out of nowhere, an Israeli soldier approached us with his Uzi machine gun and challenged us in Hebrew. We explained that we were students at the American Institute of Holy Land Studies, but he wouldn't let us go any further. It was dangerous. He sent us back. There were hazards like stones in the road where you could fall and get hurt. But suddenly they had understood the truth of the theology that they had heard. They believed it and it changed their lives forever. There was no fear. They had a message that overcame the fear even of death itself. One of the most fascinating things to me is that Jesus appeared in the room in the middle of their story to the apostles. In Luke 24, 35, and they told what things were done in the way and how he was known unto them in breaking of bread. And as they thus spake, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them and saith unto them, Peace be unto you. But they were terrified and affrighted and supposed that they had seen a spirit. Can you imagine what was going through their minds? What? How did he get here? How did he get in? We just saw him in a mess. He wasn't on the road when we ran back. We didn't pass him. We got here first and he came in after us. What's going on? They hadn't been afraid when he talked with them on the road in daylight. They hadn't been afraid as they ate dinner together. They hadn't been afraid when he broke the bread and disappeared. They hadn't been afraid when they were alone with him. They hadn't been afraid when they ran out into the night. But now they were with all the apostles and suddenly they were afraid, even with a big group standing around and inside of a room. I think it's self-evident that as they began to understand more, they suddenly realized just how little they were and how big Jesus is. But he speaks a word of peace to them and gives them three lines of proof so that they will know that he is not a ghost. Behold my hands and feet. Handle me and see. And they gave him a piece of broiled fish and of a an honeycomb, and he took it and did eat before them. He gave them three forms of legal eyewitness proof. One, visible proof. Behold my hands and feet. Two, tangible, that is touchable proof. Handle me and see, for a spirit hath not flesh and bones. Three, empirical proof. And they gave him a piece of broiled fish and of a an honeycomb, and he took it and did eat before them. Notice, for the rest of the apostles, it was after this that he opened their understanding. And he said unto them, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me, then opened he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. He said these things after he had given the three lines of legal eyewitness proof. You see, giving eyewitness proof still doesn't answer the question, so what does this mean? How does it all fit together? He opened their understanding to the scriptures. The Bible was there all along. They had heard the Sabbath, Sabbath in the synagogue ever since they were kids. They had heard the rabbis preach it. They had been to the temple in Jerusalem and heard the priests explain it on all the great feast days. They would listened to Jesus for three years as he taught and explained it and worked miracles to prove that he was the Messiah. 
but it takes the supernatural work of the Spirit of God to understand the Scriptures. Only God can open the understanding. That's what the doctrine of illumination is all about. Understanding the Bible is not the same thing as understanding the plot in the Shakespeare play. It's not the same as understanding the epic poem of Beowulf. It's not the same as understanding a textbook on the calculus of trigonometry. The Bible is a supernatural book, and it takes a supernatural act to cause the human spirit to understand not just the raw facts, but how it applies to you personally. The raw facts. You all know them. You've shown up here this morning to remember the resurrection about 2,000 years ago. You come to church every week, more or less. You do stuff. But do you really understand the scriptures? How has it changed your life? Have you been transformed, energized, slapped awake with a shock as to what it means for you personally? Or do you still just fumble through life with very little joy, very little peace, very little motivation to do more than the bare minimum so that you can at least maintain a veneer of Christianity? Are you like the two on the road to Emmaus leaving Jerusalem, talking about what you know, getting ready for dinner in bed? Or are you like the two on the road from Emmaus, racing as fast as possible to get back to Jerusalem to share the news of the risen Christ? Emmaus and faith. That's what it's all about. Faith without works is dead. Remember, head knowledge is not faith. Warm fuzzies are not faith. Rationalism is not faith. Sight is not faith. Correct theology is not faith. Only the Holy Spirit can give you the life-changing illumination that brings saving faith and serving faith to your heart. What makes you think that you have it if there has never been any change in your life? Are you dragging your feet away from Jerusalem or are you racing back to Jerusalem with the incredible good news that Jesus is indeed alive and that he can give men, women, boys, girls new life if only they will believe? The Apostle Paul got it right when he wrote, Examine yourselves whether ye be in the faith. Prove your own selves. Know ye not your own selves? How that Jesus Christ is in you, except ye be reprobates? Only you can answer that question on this bright and early morning as we remember and celebrate the most joyful sunrise since the creation of the world. We know the facts. Our celebration was announced first by angels, heard by women, spread by apostles, seen by over 500 Christians at once. Our joyful celebration today struck screeching terror in the hearts of hardened soldiers, produced chaos and fusion among hypocritical religious leaders, resulted in the payment of huge bribes to spread lies, and ended with the political manipulation of the ruling governor. But all of the political, pseudo-legal, and mafia-like religious machines of the ancient world, and all the rubbish theologians down to this present day, could not crush the Rose of Sharon could not trample the lily of the valley, could not extinguish the blinding light of salvation, could not deny by death the overwhelming power of life, and could not stop the mouths of the witnesses. Oh, that's us. Who knew what they had seen was true. Christ is risen. The victory is won. It is over. There is no fear of death. We are free. You know that every year I go to Alabama where I visit Judy's grave. I know from the depths of my heart the pain that the women and the other disciples felt as they came to the tomb and as they sat in sorrow in the upper room. But there's a great difference in my visits to Judy's grave. I have enormous human sorrow in my heart, a sorrow that God is using to burn away the trash out of my life. God is using that painful experience to conform me to the image of Christ. But here's the difference. I lie with certainty and believe with all my heart that the resurrection of life is coming. 
for all those who have died in Christ. And that has changed my life. I know with certainty and believe with all my heart that it will happen at the rapture and that if I'm still alive in this body when it happens, Judy will be raised in less than a twinkling of an eye before I'm caught up in the clouds to be with Christ to see her again. That little cemetery is a very beautiful place. A peaceful, quiet place in the tranquil countryside. A place where many Bible-believing Christians are buried. That means it's a place that will be mostly empty when the trumpet sounds. But it's still a place of the dead. Does that cemetery motivate me to give up? Does it motivate me to quit and to throw in the towel? Does it motivate me to become cynical and bitter? No. Instead, our memory motivates me to redouble my efforts, to press forward in renewed service to our risen Lord. And every time we celebrate Resurrection Sunday, the overwhelming hope and joy bursts forth inside of me with new life, new zeal, with increased power and conviction. How about you? Are you so far from that first resurrection morning that its power and light have become faint and dim in your daily life? Or are you like the two on the road back from Emmaus, like the apostles after the day of Pentecost, like the early church facing the overwhelming odds of the world, and others who with determined strides, struck, solid grip, set jaw, eagle eye, pierced through the darkness, carry the flaming baton of the gospel through the night toward the break of day? Are you one of them? Are you one of them? Or do you hesitate? Piddle around, shuffle your feet, yawn and stretch, read the junk mail, turn your back, drop the baton, stop for a hot dog, watch the cheerleaders, waste time, argue about mundane trivia and things that you don't like at the church. Take a nap, slip anonymously into the cloud, make a feeble excuse that you don't feel well, shrink fearfully at the challenge and ultimately disobey your Lord who thrust you into the line of witnesses. Yes, you are called to be a witness just as we just read in Luke and Acts. Whether you like it or not, and you will give a sober account to the one who gave you this commission, Jesus himself. The resurrection of Christ should change your life. So how has the resurrection of Christ changed your life as it did with the sudden blast of faith in the hearts of two people rushing back from Emmaus? Or are you like the despondent travelers heading out of town toward Emmaus? What you really believe determines the energy and the zeal in the things for which you live. Where is the focus of your energy and zeal? What you really believe changes your life. The resurrection is not only the truth of the past and the hope of the present, it's the guarantee of the future. Without the resurrection of Christ, we are, as Paul puts it so well, of all men most miserable. So back to Emmaus in faith. How has the resurrection changed your life? That's the proof that you really believe. Amen. Gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you for the transforming work of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit who irresistibly draws us to Christ. The Holy Spirit who causes us to hear the word of God, for faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, the scriptures. The one who at precisely the right moment opens our eyes, gives us illumination, causes us to understand. The one who gives to us saving faith causes us to believe. And the one who then transforms our lives, changes our lives. As we rush into his service to proclaim the living Christ, 
regardless of the obstacles, regardless of the enemy, regardless of the warfare that is before us, with joy, because Jesus is alive. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. We are your witnesses. Make us faithful. For we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Our closing hymn for today is hymn number, is the one on the